The 12th of March, 1938. German troops cross the border with Austria and invade the country without firing a single shot. They are not met with armed resistance, but with cheers and flowers. While thousands of Austrians turn out to greet Adolf Hitler as he travels first to Linz and then on to Vienna, terrified Jews, leftists, and other opponents of the Nazi regime race towards the country's borders, hoping to reach them before they are closed, but most would become trapped in a rapidly Nazifying Austria. In the weeks that follow, there is pogrom-like violence across the country. Austrian Nazis and others beat up, attack, and humiliate the Jews. They force them to scrub the streets, clean public toilets, and perform humiliating exercises. Many decide to try to leave Austria, and lines appear at consulates across the city of Vienna. One of the most fanatical Austrian Nazis, who will become a key figure in the implementation of the final solution, is Odilo Globocznik. Odilo Lothar Ludwig Globocznik, the son of an Austrian Croat family of low-ranking officials, was born on the 21st of April, 1904, in Trieste, then part of Austria-Hungary. Globocznik was a builder by profession, and in the 1920s he worked as a technician and a construction supervisor. In 1931, he joined the Nazi party in Austria, engaged in several illegal activities for the party, and was imprisoned several times as a result. In January 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany, and he fully intended to bring about an Austro-German Union. However, Germany was not immediately militarily and diplomatically ready to carry out Hitler's foreign policy goals. First, Hitler and other Nazi leaders focused on establishing a Nazi dictatorship. However, behind the scenes the Nazi leadership began planning territorial expansion and a European war almost as soon as they took power. Beginning in May 1933, the Austrian Nazis waged a propaganda and terror campaign which was encouraged and funded by Germany. The Nazi goal was to undermine the regime of the Austrian Chancellor, Engelbert Dollfuss, by making it look incompetent. They staged disruptive protests and brawled with political opponents and the police. Austrian Nazis set off explosives and tear gas bombs in public places and Jewish-owned businesses. One of the bombs was thrown on the 12th of June, 1933, in Vienna into a jewelry shop owned by Norbert Futterweit, who was of Jewish descent. As a result of the bomb explosion, Futterweit was instantly dead, and there were several people badly injured at the store and on the street. Several historians believe that Globocznik was behind the attack. Futterweit's murder was one of the attacks that led to the ban of the Austrian Nazi party and its affiliates on the 19th of June, 1933. However, although the Nazi movement became illegal in Austria, the Austrian Nazis continued to operate illegally within the country. In August 1933, Globocznik was arrested for the first time for his attempt to contact imprisoned Nazis at Klagenfurt. Between 1933 and 1935, he was arrested four times but served just over a year in jail because Heinrich Himmler, the German head of the SS, always intervened on his behalf. Himmler liked Globocznik, familiarly called him Globus, and recognized the value of this ruthless Austrian. His fanatical devotion to the Nazi cause paid off for Globocznik, as he quickly climbed the ladder of the party apparatus in his native Austria, and in 1936 he was appointed provincial Nazi chief of the Carinthia region. At that time, Globocznik was ridiculed by other Nazis for his Slavic surname, as the Nazis classified Slavs as subhumans. However, senior Nazis such as Heinrich Himmler defended him, saying that he was of Aryan origin and that his surname was a result of Slavicization. In the spring of 1938, Adolf Hitler annexed the federal state of Austria into the German Reich. The Anschluss, as it became known, took place over three days between the 11th and 13th of March, 1938. On the 24th of May of the same year, Globocznik was promoted to the post of regional Nazi party leader of Vienna. Globocznik then launched a crusade against the church and the Nazis confiscated property, closed Catholic organizations, and sent many priests to Dachau. Anger at the treatment of the church in Austria grew quickly, and in October 1938, the first act of overt mass resistance to the new regime took place. A rally of thousands left mass in Vienna chanting, Christ is our Führer, before being dispersed by police. After Cardinal Theodor Initzer denounced Nazi persecution of the church, a Nazi mob ransacked his residence. The power went right to Globocznik's head, and he got involved in foreign currency speculation using an astonishing number of dirty tricks, particularly in financial matters. Odilo Globocznik was also a sexual deviant, who used his power to force girls from the Austrian upper classes to sexual orgies. 
because of these reasons. In 1939, he was stripped of his party honours. A major factor behind his downfall was Hermann Göring, who had made efforts to have Globochnik dismissed from his high party office. Himmler then transferred Globochnik to the Waffen-SS, which was the military branch of the SS with which he took part in the invasion of Poland. The Polish campaign, which marked the beginning of the Second World War, began on the 1st of September 1939 after a false accusation that the Poles attacked a German radio station. After defeating the Polish army, the Germans ruthlessly suppressed the Poles, whom they considered to be racially inferior, and in the weeks following the German attack on Poland, German SS, police, and military units shot thousands of Polish civilians, including many members of the Polish nobility, clergy, and intelligentsia. In the fall of 1941, Nazi Germany began to implement a plan codenamed Operation Reinhardt to systematically murder almost two million Jews living in the German-administered territory of occupied Poland called the General Government. Because Heinrich Himmler chose Globotnik as the central figure for Operation Reinhardt, he pardoned him and on the 9th of November 1939 appointed Globotnik to the post of SS and police leader for the Lublin district. After his initially disappointing party career, Odilo Globochnik now had a second chance in the ranks of the SS and the police, and for his generosity, he promised Himmler he would kill a million Jews. In the meantime, Globochnik's men had begun mass executions of Jews. In October 1941, a Captain Kleinschmidt and 15 men, each with their own truck, took a total of about 450 Jews to an abandoned airfield located approximately 25 miles from Lublin. The Jews were forced to dig a ditch, some six cubic meters in size, and line it with straw. What followed is beyond the grasp of imagination. After finishing the ditches, ten of the victims took off their clothes and were given corrugated paper shirts reaching halfway down the thighs. The victims were ordered, ten at a time, to lie down in the ditches, alternately head to foot. Then Globochnik's men threw hand grenades into the ditches, and heads, arms, and legs quickly filled the air. The troops shot anyone still moving after the explosion. Then they spread lime over the remains, and a new layer of straw was spread on top of the lime. Three or four layers of bodies, ten in each layer, were placed in such a grave. During the executions, the other victims had to watch and await their turn. Women were kicked in the stomach and breasts, children smashed against rocks. It is believed that Globotnik may have been the originator of the extermination camp industrialized murder concept and the one who suggested it to Himmler. At a two-hour meeting with Himmler on the 13th of October 1941, Globotnik received verbal approval to start construction work on Belgium's extermination camp, the first such camp in the general government. The construction of three more camps, Sobibor, Majdanek, and Treblinka, followed in 1942. When he was given the order to create these camps, he spoke to his men, saying, the Reichsführer of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, has just given us a new task. I am so grateful that you can be sure that his wishes will be fulfilled immediately. Globotnik proposed exterminating the Jews in an assembly line fashion in concentration camps using gas chambers. The gassing facilities that Globotnik established at Belzhets, soon after his 13th of October meeting with Himmler, were designed by T4 program personnel assigned to him. They used carbon monoxide as the T4 program had done. His men killed thousands of Polish and Russian Jews every hour. After a few months in operation, he gave the order to make new gas chambers in which 2,000 people could be entered each time. It is estimated that 600,000 Jews were murdered in Belzhets alone. This was, however, not enough for Globochnik, and he complained that deportations were insufficient and his death camps had even greater killing power. At some point, he had a confrontation with Rudolf Hess, the commander of Auschwitz. Auschwitz was a slave labor camp, whereas the camps Globochnik oversaw were death camps, places where Jews were taken only to be killed. Haas and Globochnik fought publicly before their superiors to take credit for who killed the most people. They accused each other of being ineffective and untidy. Haas tried to get his rival to use Zyklon B, the gas with which they killed the Jews in the Auschwitz chambers. But Globochnik still preferred carbon monoxide. From 1942 to 1943, he also oversaw the beginning of the Generalplan Ostplan, or Master Plan for the East, devised by Nazi leaders in 1941 and 1942 to resettle Eastern Europe with Germans and move about other inferior groups within the Nazis' domain. The territories involved included the occupied areas of Poland, the Baltic states Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, Belarus, and parts of Russia and the Ukraine. There were about 45 million people living in those areas in the early 1940s, including 5 to 6 million Jews. 
the Nazis came up with an elaborate racial classification system by which to decide who would be enslaved, expelled, murdered, or resettled. Some 31 million of the territory's inhabitants, mostly of Slavic origin, were to be declared racially undesirable and expelled to Western Siberia. The Jews were to be annihilated, euphemistically referred to as total removal. The rest of the local population would be enslaved, Germanized, or killed. After the area was cleared out, 10 million Germans and people of German origin, called ethnic Germans, were to be moved in. During the German occupation of Poland, the SS had set up in the general government a number of industrial enterprises exclusively manned by Jewish labor. In Lublin, Globocznik was the overseer and main director of these enterprises, which made large profits for the SS and, of course, for a few senior SS dignitaries, including himself. From the slaughter of 1.7 million Jews in the Operation Reinhard Killing Centers and related mass shootings, Globocznik became immensely rich. The property of the victims ranging from their houses and their valuables down to the gold in their teeth was seized by the SS. In a report Globocznik sent to Himmler on the 5th of January 1944, he gave an enumeration of the money, the gold, and other valuables stolen from the Jews during Operation Reinhardt. Converted to Reichsmarks, Globocznik arrived at a total amount of 178 million Reichsmarks, then equal to 71 million United States dollars. Globocznik stole for himself approximately 12.5 million Reichsmarks, then equal to 5 million United States dollars. Globocznik carried out Himmler's orders with brutal efficiency, and by November 1943, Operation Reinhardt had been completed and the three death camps directly under his control were liquidated. On the 19th of April 1943, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising began after the German troops and police entered the ghetto to deport its surviving inhabitants to the forced labor camps in the Lublin district. The ghetto inhabitants offered organized resistance in the first days of the operation, inflicting casualties on the well-armed and well-equipped SS and police units. They continued to resist deportation as individuals or in small groups for four weeks. It was the largest uprising by Jews during World War II and the first significant urban revolt against the German occupation in Europe. In the end, however, the Germans raised the ghetto to the ground. They burned and demolished this part of Warsaw, block by block, in order to smoke out their prey. The Germans ended the operation on the 16th of May when Jürgen Strupp, who led the suppression of the uprising, announced in his daily report to Berlin that the former Jewish quarter in Warsaw is no more. The SS and police deported approximately 42,000 Warsaw Ghetto survivors captured during the uprising to the forced labor camps at Poniatowa and Travniki and to the Majdanek concentration camp. At least 7,000 Jews died fighting or in hiding in the ghetto as they were burnt alive or died from smoke inhalation. The SS and police sent another 7,000 to the Treblinka Killing Center. Odilo Globocznik took part in the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. He was also put in charge of liquidating the Biastok Ghetto, which stood out for its strong resistance to German occupation. During the August 1943 deportations, when all hope for survival within the ghetto was abandoned, the Biastok Ghetto underground staged an uprising against the Germans. In an unsuccessful attempt to break out of the ghetto and join partisans in the nearby forests, armed Jews attacked German forces near the ghetto fence along Smolna Street. The fighting in the northeastern section of the ghetto lasted for five days. Hundreds of Jews died in this battle. 71 Jewish fighters were killed after being discovered in a bunker and captured by the Germans. More than 100 Jews managed to escape from the ghetto and join partisan groups in the Bialystok area. This uprising lasted from the 16th to the 20th of August, 1943. Against a group of about 300 to 500 insurgents armed with 25 rifles and 100 pistols, as well as homemade Molotov cocktails for grenades, Odilo Gorboznik sent a tank. In spite of the insurgency, the planned deportations to concentration and extermination camps went ahead on the 17th of August, 1943, without any delay. Approximately 10,000 Jews were led to the Holocaust trains and sent to camps in Treblinka, Majdanek, and Auschwitz. A transport of 1,200 children was sent to the Riesenstadt concentration camp and later to Auschwitz, where they were murdered. It is estimated that out of almost 60,000 Jews who lived in Białystok before World War II, only several hundred survived the Holocaust. During his time in German-occupied Poland, Globocznik became increasingly addicted to alcohol and allegedly would drink up to three liters of vodka per day. While performing his duties, he was still drinking, which increased his aggressiveness not only towards Jews, but also fellow SS officers. Himmler's brother-in-law, Richard Wendler, the civil governor in Lublin district, had used his personal relationship with Himmler to urge him to do something about Globocznik and said to Himmler, 
Above all, I thank you for clearing the air regarding the SS and police leader in Lublin, and trust you will transfer him somewhere else. This is the only noble and possible solution. I must even ask you today to transfer Gruppenführer Globochnik within the shortest time to his new field of activity, and remove him from here. At that time, Globochnik was already complicit in the extermination of 1.7 million Jews, as well as a smaller number of non-Jews in the death camps under his control. Globochnik, together with a large number of experienced killers, then moved to Trieste, and he was promoted to the post of higher SS and police leader of the Adriatic region. At the San Saba concentration camp in northern Italy near Trieste, on the 9th of October 1943, Globochnik had a hand in killing 2,000 Jews and political prisoners. Ivan Marchenko, a notorious guard at the Treblinka extermination camp, known as Ivan the Terrible, participated in the killings at this camp. Italian Jews, partisans, and other political dissidents were interrogated, tortured, and murdered under the direction of Globochnik and his men after the 1943 downfall of Benito Mussolini and the German takeover of the country. Many prisoners of Rizera di San Saba were transported to the German Nazi concentration camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau. On the 31st of May 1945, three weeks after the war in Europe ended, 41-year-old Odilo Globochnik was captured by the British Army at Weisenzee in Austrian Carinthia. However, he would never face justice for his crimes. The same day he was captured, Globochnik committed suicide by swallowing a capsule of cyanide. His body was then taken to be buried in a local churchyard, but the priest reportedly refused to have the body of such a man resting in consecrated ground. A grave was dug outside the churchyard, next to an outer wall, and the body was buried without ceremony. There were no tears shed for Odilo Globochnik. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.